All right, Liz. Congrats. Thank you. I know that one felt good to you. Yeah, you know, I definitely didn't want any dominance on her part. Um, but if there's one thing I could just feel in the way her body was moving, she didn't struggle to miss weight. <laughs> you know, she struggled in having to go back four times and keeping pushed to make it. But even then, she still didn't make the weight. And I could feel that in the beginning. But eventually, she wasn't going to back. Her gas tank didn't have it no matter what she did. So talk me through that. Would you, uh, as somebody who <laughs> clearly never cuts weight, uh, I know you said in there that you felt that she was going to be stronger early because she didn't have as hard of a weight cut. But obviously, we're sitting there watching the weigh-ins, and we know that she went from 127.2 to 126.2 or whatever it was, and it looked like that probably took a lot out of her to, to drop that extra pound. So is, was there, did that not take as much out of her as, as we think that it, that it should have? Not even slightly. If you watched her, every time she had to go back up on the scale, there was nobody having to walk with her. There was, it was an ease up there. She kind of made a face like, oh, not, I know I'm not going to make it. If you have the energy to put on a face, if you have the energy to joke around and make light of the fact that you're not making weight, you have the energy to stay in that sauna, work out, and make the weight. So she was fine. It's just her claim to fame in this sport is missing weight, not making weight. That, that shouldn't be it. You're a professional MMA fighter. You think you deserve to be the champion by missing weight, and that's your whole career. You don't deserve to have the belt. Yeah. Now, if she'd put on that performance having made weight, I, could, I would be saying something different. I would give her props for what she did. But the reality is she cheated yet again by missing weight, like I said she would before this fight. Um, we saw the scorecards. It was 30-27 on all three going into the fourth. Where did you feel like it was going into the fourth? And did you feel like it's not even going to matter anyways because I know this is about the point that I can turn it on and I'll just put her away? No, absolutely not. I, I never bank on that. You know, anything could happen. What I was banking on is, for one, I, we had been saying we want to have fun. I wanted to throw that spinning heel kick, and I saw how she would keep her right hand down, and I wanted to catch her on the chin. I, I miscalculated that kick and ultimately gave her a takedown. Uh, and she was doing really good on top. I mean, if I outweighed somebody and I didn't have to cut the weight, I would do pretty well on top, too, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> sure. So, um, no, that wasn't what I was banking on. I wasn't banking on having to carry into the fourth and the fifth round into a championship fight. I wanted to finish her off and make a huge statement and shut her up and get her out of the sport so she can take her crude remarks and her lack of professionalism somewhere else. So that, that said, uh, the, the glove touch at the beginning was interesting. You did eventually do it. But did you go in there thinking, I'm not touching gloves with her? Um, no, you know, uh, when the ref brings us over, he usually kind of makes us touch gloves. And if they put their gloves out, I will. If they don't, uh, then I don't. I usually pay respects to my opponents, and I believe in touching gloves then. And at no point, once, once the bell rings, I'm not going to play the game of touching gloves and let mm. you get a, a crazy swing. And with somebody that I don't trust for, for being a cheater, I'm not going to trust that she's going to take advantage in that moment either. But when she kind of gave me a look and put her gloves on, I was like, well, that's a weird way to do it, but okay. <laughs> she talked to you afterwards. Um, you appeared to be very... Absolutely, of course. You were, you were you. You were professional. You were perfect. You were cordial. What did she say to you? And at that point, are you just rolling your eyes in, in your mind and, and not wanting to get caught on camera rolling your eyes? No, it wasn't even caught on camera. It's just uh, not buying into the, the BS. Uh, she, just like our previous fight, she's like, hey, I'm so sorry. You know, I just didn't make weight complications. It's not, I don't want to hear it. Um, last time she said, oh, well, it was my menstrual cycle. It was that time of the month. I'm like, yes, yeah, so was mine, but I made the weight. Mm -hmm. Those excuses don't fly. If you're a professional, you, you know, like I put up a video today showing people what I do to make sure that I meal prep correctly, that I do everything by the book. I stay up until 11 p.m. at night cutting the weight, and then I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go double and triple check on the scale just to be sure that something didn't magically happen. Like maybe I slept walk and started drinking water in the middle of the night. You know, I just don't take any chances because – we're professionals in the sport, and we're in one of the biggest organizations in the world, and we're here in front of all these fans and all these people as a representative of the sport and as a representative of women. We have a right to show that to everybody, sure. and you have to do it the best way possible. So I check with everything, and she was just once again saying that she was sorry she didn't make weight, but she had nothing but respect for me. To me, if you miss weight again for the second time and you laugh it off, you don't respect your opponent. You don't care for the work that they're putting in. Um, you didn't call anybody out, but you know you're getting called out tomorrow by somebody no matter what. So, I mean, is that why you didn't call anybody out? Because you, you'll just wait for that one? And, um, and, and as far as you're concerned, everything's on track for, for the, the fairy tale story here for, for Bellator Women's Flyweight Division? 
Yeah, basically, I know I'm going to be in attendance of the, the event tomorrow night. First of all, it's Hawaii, and I love that we put on these back-to-back -back events, so I can't actually be in attendance. Because when I go off to fight camp, my whole focus is on fight preparation, making sure I'm as prepared as possible, so I don't stay up late and go to fights. And if a fight's at 11 o'clock at night, I'm playing old lady, and I'm like, no, I got to get my rest because I got to get up early to train, so I miss the fights. Um, but when I get to be out here, I actually get to attend, and I get to watch them in person, I get to be excited. I get to support my friend Alima, and while I'm a big fan of Kana and I'm a big fan of Alima, at the end of the day, I'm a bigger fan of Alima, and I want to see her succeed. And um, we know she's already said, I'll be in attendance, and I, I perfectly expect at the end of the fight to get called into the cage and asked to, to be fighting against them. Sure. Uh, and then finally, you know, how big was this for you to be able to do this in, in this kind of a setting, in this kind of environment for the troops? And, you know, can you just speak on that a little bit? Yeah, it means a lot because, you know, I, I did a, a similar card years ago and I felt like it didn't represent myself the way that I wanted to. And it was starting to look that way again. But I dug deep in myself. I was like, no, that's not how this is going out. I'm not a quitter. I'm not about to stop now. I'm going to show them what it means to be a Marine. And no matter how difficult it is, no matter how hard it seems, you, you find the ability, you find the way, and you get it done. Mm -hmm. Hey, Liz. Hey. Kay Williams for Can Chronicles Media. Congratulations on the win. Thank you. What do you feel the turning point was tonight that led to your victory? Um, I think the turning point was just knowing uh, that she had a little bit of confidence in herself for how the one through three went, but I could also see that she was looking tired. Right? And I knew that we talked about it with my coach, and we're like, this isn't happening anymore. And he told me, he's like, this is it. You gave her three, finish it now, we're done with this. I'm like, yeah, I, why am I doing this? Like, finish her, let's be over and done with. And I felt like I almost had her with that 10-finger guillotine. I could feel her kind of gargling, but it wouldn't quite sit right. And then I almost made the mistake of sitting all the way to my butt, and I was like, oh, I messed up. That took the angle. And I was like, no, we, I, I got there, and I almost had her. Let's finish this, let's be done with this. Um, I thought I almost had her with the crucifix, but she was hiding out really well. And at that point, I'm like, once I got her close, I could feel her energy level dying down, and I knew that I could finish it from there. And also, do you feel like her having a heavier body this time around um, kind of altered your ground strategies? Yeah, absolutely. I think in, in any time when somebody, one, has more energy coming into it, when they have additional weight, when you, you did everything proper, of course that's going to play a factor. And it definitely did in the top game where I could feel like, okay, I can't quite get the angle I want because she has those extra pounds on me. And one last question, because I, I love your introspective mind. Um, you like to expand on you know, certain questions, so I have to ask you, Liz, what does professionalism mean to you in the sport of MMA, and personally? Um, professionalism means a lot of things. You know, There's a difference between an, an amateur fighter and a professional fighter. A professional fighter goes out there to represent the sport, to represent their gym, to represent their coaches, and everybody puts time and energy into them. And you have to go out there as that representative and put on your best performance. That's from the moment that you sign the contract. It's not going out late at night drinking. It's not going out eating tons of junk food. It's, it's committed to a lifestyle of MMA and a lifestyle of being a representative of everybody around you because when we do this sport, I'm not the only person going in the sacrificing the cage. My coaches take time away from their families. They take off their vacations. They come out here. They do sleepless nights worrying if I'm, if I'm okay with the cut, worrying if, if I'm recovering okay. And so I'm not the only one that's suffering in this and, and giving the sacrifice. So a professional goes out there knowing that it, while it is an individual within the cage, it's a team that takes you to get there, and you have to go out there and support them. Liz, thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll go ahead and take one question from Zoom. Jay Anderson. Thanks very much uh, for your time. And apologies if uh, this was answered. My audio cut out there for a bit. But just curious, we know that Alima has talked about the end of her career being on the horizon. Have you thought about how much longer you'll continue on with this? Because it, it feels like you're starting to come to that point now where you've gone through a lot of the contenders in the division. Now you're possibly looking at some rematches. Yeah, you know, um, my the end of my career doesn't depend on my re on the rematches of the, the people around me. That means that they have to step it up. I'm not about to hang up my gloves just because the people around me aren't ready to do that. There are plenty of women that I, I've had the opportunity to watch them compete, and they're right there. They're, they're ready to step up, so I'm not about to step down just because uh, I have to take a rematch. 